Uh, hi, everybody. I'm going to refresh this real quick. I'm going to go back to my title slide. This is actually really great because it's a little bit of glitch art, like right in the middle of my presentation that's completely unplanned. Uh, I love it. So here's the agenda. Here's what we're going to talk about. I also have a lot of chords up here. I'm here to talk to you guys about math, art, and code. And one of those things may not seem like the others, but hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll sort of understand where I'm coming from with this weird transitive property uh, equation. If you think about color palettes, right? So math equals art is pretty great. There's a lot of math made out of, uh, in, inside of art, and there's a lot of art that's made out of math. Color palettes. If you want to make something visually pleasing, you usually have to follow um, a mathematical principle for split complementary or compound or triads. There's a lot of math that goes into just color. And you think about music. Music's really amazing. It can make you feel sorrowful or triumphant. But when you get down to it, it's just data. It's a time signature and a scale, and it's points on that scale, which are data points or notes. Gang a bunch of those up, and you have a chord. And then you can give that to anybody, and if they can render that, i.e. play an instrument, they get to actually recreate that music anywhere. And it's the same thing with code art. You can make it in JavaScript, share it with the world, seven billion people can look at it. Different medium, but same general principle. Hello, everybody. That was echoey. I'm John Brown, and I'm from Portland, Oregon, which is about as far from here as you can get on the continental United States, so I've had a long flight. Um, I work at a place where I get to uh, lead a team that gets to play with new and emerging tech and use them in creative ways, and also work on outer active retail experiences. What that means is I do a lot of stuff, front end, back end, hardware, software, and I do a lot of really cool stuff, and more and more and more I'm doing it with just JavaScript. And I'm going to talk to you guys about a few projects that are essentially 100% JavaScript that I'm really rad, or that I think are really rad and I'm really proud of. But at night, I work with a group in Portland that does all kinds of code art and generative art. And I'm one of the sort of leaders of that community that I put on uh, events uh, that are community art projects. I take part in those. I put on smaller projects. And I'm a digital artist, and I'm really proud to say that. And I have the pedigree. Uh, I really feel like I can say this because like all great artists, I've dropped out of art school. <laughs> Two times. <laughs> My mom's not happy with that slide. Um, so these are a few uh, selected math works. I play a lot with math. And this is an exploration of sine and cosine, perfectly said. Uh, Sine and cosine at its most basic is rotation and it's circular mo movement and you can create amazing things just by layering. And I'm actually really proud to be here today. Um, I'm kind of bummed that I'm not in Portland right now because there's a art show going on, Visions of Tomorrows. It actually starts tomorrow. Uh, but I have a piece in there and it's a generative art piece. And it is hanging up alongside sculptures, uh, oil paintings, mixed media, just, I, I just like to talk, I just wanted to point it out because it's, it's one of these things where people a lot of times don't think digital art is true art, uh, but it really is. It's recognized by all the important people, in my opinion. Um, so why am I here? Why am I at a JavaScript conference talking about art? Seems a little weird. Well, if we go back to this, uh, the, t the title of the talk, we are talked a little bit about math and art. Art and code, I feel like these two things are very intertwined if you want to explore them, if you want to try being an artist, or if you are an artist. Learning is way more fun if you're making art. If you think about, if you, wanna, if you have a dream in the middle of the night and you want to create it, and it involves web sockets, it's this rad artistic, pro, or it, it's this rad artistic project, and you think, I should use web sockets for this. Unlike at work where it's a mandate, it's like now we're using web sockets, now we're using web sockets, and uh, you have to learn those, you have to go read tech docs, you have to read some tutorials. Now you get to explore and try a bunch of new things, and the outcome doesn't really matter because it's your project, and you're just trying things. And even along the way, even if things are broken, just like a glitchy screen, you can still create beautiful things with art. And so that leads me to also freedom of personal projects. If you're making art, you're very rarely, unfortunately, going to be making it for a paying client. So you get to do anything you want. Anything you can dream, you can try and recreate. Um, there's any kind of analog from the fine art world or the traditional art world in digital art. 
Um, you can do 3D printing for sculptures. You can do uh, watercolor like canvas work. And then there's things that you can't do in the fine art traditional world that you can do in digital art. There's also a lot of new problems that come up when you're making things creatively. And one really rad like, segment of that is, is that when you go to work, and let's take a different example. Let's say you're working on an e-commerce platform. If the payment goes through the payment portal, cool, done. If it doesn't, that's the, that's the other answer. It's binary. But if you're making art, you get to explore it and you get to try all kinds of different things. It's, is the line light good? Uh, how is this color palette making me feel? Are there too many particles on the stage? It's a bunch of different uh, problems you have to solve and you have to use a different part of your brain. And I don't buy into like, the left brain, right brain idea. I think that's been debunked a lot. But you definitely get to flex different creative skills, problem solving when you're making art. So what I'm going to do is walk you guys through a few projects. This first one, I'm real nervous about this. Anybody that's ever seen me talk knows I go a little bit overboard on demos. Um, so this is the seventh thing I have plugged into my computer right now. <laughs> and it's upside down. It's not even USB either. Uh, all right, so here's what we're going to do. This is work in progress number 233. Deep breath, everybody. Mostly me. There it is. OK. All right, if we look up yonder, we look up here. As I'm going over this color palette, Right? We're getting different things on here. And you, can, I, you probably can't see that very well. But here's the thing. Like, I'm, I'm running around in this. This is a node project. It's a nerd, node server, a node client. It's picking up what pixels I'm sort of going over with my mouse. And think of this as like a really weird aspect ratio screen. <laughs> but then if I go outside of the browser, it's still working. And that's the power of node, man. It's, it's amazing. It will, like, you can run it on the lowest server, or the lowest, like, server and, like, uh, operations on your computer. So the reason why I want to do this is because I actually don't tell anybody from my work, but I want to uh, take this, I want to hang it up at work over the weekend and give everybody on my team the client software for this. So hopefully it'll look a little something like this. Again, some fingers crossed. Okay. So this is like five this is a recording session of like five different mouse points. I knew that wasn't going to work. You son of a bee. <laughs> so imagine you know, a lot of different pieces. Oh, I'm up on stage. Whoa. Uh, imagine all these like flying around and a really amazing piece of art that's being created like accidentally in the background over time that nobody's really working towards, but there's an amazing uh, but there's an amazing like, piece of art that's going on in the background, and it's community-driven. So, oh, OK. Hello, OK. Yes. I'm going to start un un unplugging some of these things. So here's the thing. This is a work in progress. So why show you guys this? Um, a couple reasons. So one, uh, I think it's important to show things like as you're working on them. Anybody can like, go on and post a highlight reel on their Instagram, but I think it's really cool to do small incremental pieces because when you're making art, even the steps towards the final product are all, presumably all, beautiful and they're worth sharing. And this is a true work in progress because this is at 3.30 p.m. Monday, the day before I left. This is it in a suitcase at 5.45 p.m. And this is me working on it that day and this is me earlier this morning like running around in my hotel room like putting this together and like over here. So again, I just want to show you that don't be afraid when you're doing art to show it to people and to get opinions and to share it with the world. All artists have sketchbooks. This is a Van Gogh sketchbook that was recently uncovered. Even these are beautiful. Even these are amazing. Artists used to have sketchbooks like this. Now we have sketchbooks like your code pen sketchbook or just a giant messy folder on your, on your computer. So when I posited at the beginning, it's I like to use 
uh, code and or you'd like to use art to learn more code. What I want to do is, as I show these projects, talk about the things that I learned that I wouldn't have normally gotten to learn in my day-to-day in my day-to-day -day work life. First things first, bitwise operators. I sort of used them by copy-pasting them out of Stack Overflow, but now I actually understand them. And being able to push products, oh boy, being able to push pixels down this strip required me to understand bitwise operators a little bit better than I used to. LED dithering. Our eyes are amazing. They evolutionary, evolutionarily evolved to get the smaller, to notice the smallest low light changes. So when you turn on an LED to like 1%, it actually makes it look like it's like 17%. So I had to work on lookup tables and an inverse function in order to level that out so LEDs actually look like they grow and shrink, or uh, the brightness grows and shrink properly. I learned all about RAM swaps on Raspberry Pi, because if you've ever tried to build something like Phantom JS on a Raspberry Pi, you run out of memory real quick. Uh, so I had to, whoa, learn a whole bunch of stuff. There's a lot of these like uh, learning slides, so I apologize to everybody over here. Um, also, I want to say thank you because I came in this morning not sure if this project was going to work, uh, but I had some amazing help earlier today, uh, so thanks. Um, so that's a project that's a uh, work in progress. And the next couple are sort of finished products. This is from a year ago, or probably about six months ago. So this is my buddy Chris Arth, and, he and I, he's a designer, he's a print designer, and obviously I'm a developer. And he and I were hanging out, we're like, let's make something this weekend. Let's do something creative and artistic that he's never done before, which is basically most things, because again, he's just getting into the creative code side. So we decided, I had had glitch art on the mind for a lot of reasons, XOXO had just, been, had just passed, and that was the theme. And so I thought, let's make something glitchy. So when you think about glitch art, you can do one of two things. You can take the actual rendered image and like take chunks of it and smear it or move them around or whatever. Or you can do the deep dive, get into the actual guts of the image and start messing around with it. So that's the path that we chose. Oh, okay, demo number two. Let's corrupt some data. Okay, so if we look at this most nervous speaker ever, .jpg, uh, you guys may notice, or you guys may recognize him. So we take this and we open it up in our favorite text editor. This is what a JPEG looks like, everybody. What happens if you just start changing some of these numbers? Now, some people deep in take a breath. Give me a hex value. A. a. I heard an U. Who said? <laughs> somebody needs to go to the JavaScript like introduction. Uh, somebody give me another hex value. One? Two to a one? All right, we'll do it. Uh, eight to a? C. I heard B. Let's see what this looks like. Ooh, okay. All right, cool. Starting to get a little, it's a little interesting. What happens if we take, let's say, this chunk down here. Let's say this is, I don't know, this is probably beard area. <laughs> let's run it all up here. Let's drop it in yonder. Ooh, okay. Well, we broke that one. We'll talk about that. So what Chris Arthur and I did is we decided to take this idea of corrupting the underlying information of JPEGs and let's turn it into a bot that listens for your uh, listens for you to tweet at it, and then not only takes your avatar and glitches it out, but it takes your avatar, glitches it out stylistically over time, and makes an animation out of it. That's weird. What does that look like? Glad you all asked. So if we look at some of these, if you tweet at glitch avatar glitch, here's one. There's a couple in here that are fun. It's a little bit more subtle. It's a little bit, this one's a little crazy. Yeah. So if anybody wants to test out the old avatar glitch, feel free to after the talk. Pay attention. Uh, <laughs> so there, uh, because I was working with Chris Arth, he said, like, let me sort of design the way that these glitches work. And so we came up with some that are very subtle and some that are crazy. Uh, and it was a really, really good thing. I had a really good time working with Chris Arth. So what did I learn? Well, as you can see, if you just start messing around with JPEGs, you can like, corrupt them really quickly. So I had to open up a tech manual. I had to read about how JPEGs work. I had to read about the headers in JPEGs and what you can change and what you can't change so we knew that we could get decent-looking glitch art 
generatively on, uh, as it came back. I would never have had to do that in my regular job. So that's, that's a real, real awesome win. Um, I also learned about buffers and actually how to make animated GIFs. So this is something I've actually used several times since then. So it's part of this process of doing something fun and interesting and being excited about it and then using it going forward. And Chris Harth learned about how to make bots. They, uh, he had done a little bit of creative coding, but he never done anything that sort of sat there and waited and responded based on input. So it was a really fun thing to do. And then we took these learnings, we flipped it. We turned it into a teachable moment. So we went to a local meetup and we talked about the project and we actually launched it live there. It failed completely. I took a, I took a couple hours at night and like retooled it and pushed it up. Uh, but we ended up talking about it, me from a designer, nope, me from a developer standpoint, him from a designer standpoint, like where we came on that spectrum and the things he learned and the things that I learned. Uh, and speaking of which, I am the, I'm a co-organizer of that meetup group, PDX Creative Coders, uh, along with these three gentlemen. And we're a group of now almost 500 artists and developers and hackers and uh, designers that get together and make cool art generatively. Uh, we make music, we make all kinds of really cool things. And there's just a few projects from one of our hack days. Uh, and I encourage you all to find one of these near you. I love that one. Pixie JS, cool. Um, so that's a, like a small weekend project. Let's talk about a big project, a big, long, long project. Uh, how many of you guys, nope, wrong slide. This has been, how many of you guys know Ben Purdy? Sorry, that was a weird question. This is Ben Purdy, he's a friend of mine. Uh, I used to work with him at Instrument. He left, started his own creative studio called Glowbox in Portland. And he and I get together on Wednesdays and we jam, we make cool art, cool projects, creative code, hack with some hardware. And <clears throat> Cascadia JS was coming up last year, and they're having an interactive JavaScript art gallery. So he and I thought, let's make something cool for this. <coughs> oh, oh, weird. Uh, so we knew there's gonna be a lot of in the browser um, projects, and he and I wanted to make something physical and outside of the browser. So we sat there and we brainstormed, we came up with this idea. Plinko, do you guys know Plinko? From The Price is Right? This is my favorite. This is probably everybody's favorite. Uh, we said to take this game and use the nostalgia and the physics of it, combine it with JavaScript, and turn it into a digital canvas for generative art. That sounds weird. And it was, and it was hard. And it's, you can't just go like, find on the internet how to make a generative uh, pixel Plinko board. There's no like, steps for that. So it's a lot of exploration. Had to learn a lot of things, a lot of stumbling blocks. Um, but we ended up making it. It took, a, like I said, it took a lot longer than we thought it was going to, and that's one of the things with like, these weird creative code projects is they often take a lot longer than you sort of think because there's a lot of gotchas along the way. It's a lot of repetition, there's 85 pegs, we have to do a lot of things 85 times, we have a ton of stop motion, uh, 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 this isn't photography, this is photography, video. Um, and then we finally got it done and we actually put it in a couple of galleries in the last couple of months. And the response has been amazing. People love it. Kids, adults, they sort of don't really understand what it is. They read the instructions, they take one of the pucks and they walk up and they drop it. And then you see them turn around and go, oh yes, this is awesome. Then they go pick up another one and usually like two or three and they drop all three and, see, and to see what happens. Uh, but this is another one of those things about making art is that if you do it in the physical space, you actually get to see people enjoying it and interacting with it. And if you make, even if you make something beautiful on, the, on, the, on a website, you don't get to see that one-to-one you know, -one relationship uh, with the person who's actually consuming that art. So what did I learn here? Well, I didn't have to learn about rendering GIFs. We already talked about that. Learned that from Avatar Glitch. But I learned a whole lot of other stuff. Uh, a lot of hardware stuff, stuff, a little bit of software stuff. We ended up coming up, uh, Ben packaged up what we did for the projection mapping, which is all done in JavaScript, and he released it as a standalone library, which is amazing, so if anybody does projection mapping, you should check that out. But this whole project was JavaScript. <coughs> if we go back, this is all JavaScript. This is mostly Node, but this is all JavaScript. Uh, Avatar Glitch, 100% JavaScript. Uh, this was about 99.7% JavaScript, and you wouldn't think, if we go back, looking at this, you wouldn't think that this would be JavaScript, but it's a full 
a full screen Chrome browser with Canvas. It's a node backend that's running inside of the little kiosk. Uh, it tweets you, it'll, if you put your little your Twitter handle in, it'll tweet you a, a, an animation of your run. 100%, um, well 99.7% JavaScript. So all of you can make art, because hopefully you understand JavaScript as you're at a JavaScript conference. Okay, we're gonna wrap this up. My timer went out, so I don't actually know how much time I have. We're gonna assume like 27 more minutes. I don't know, I'm just gonna start rambling. So again, anybody that's seen my talks before knows that this final part's always a little rough because this is uh, homework. Homework, what? Yes, homework, you guys have to do this. Not really, not contractually. So I'm gonna give you guys a couple of options for making homework, or for making some things. And the reason I want to give you guys this option is each one of these should take you one to two hours. I would love for you guys just to carve off a little bit of time from your day to day and just try something new and try flexing a different part of your brain and try just exploring a creative path. We think of this stuff as uh, expressive instead of functional programming. We, I don't know, we are the greater community. Um, so the first option is Uncontext. So this is a project that I, that I run that is publicly accessible web sockets that you can connect to. And none of these parameters really tell you what they are, A, B, C, D, E, F. And the point here is these change over time, and they change according to rules, and they change at certain patterns. But none of these tell you what to do with the data. You could use D to control color for something, or speed, or rotation, or number of particles. Uh, same thing with any of these different parameters. It doesn't matter. Whatever you make with this is 100% your personality coming out in this. So whatever you have in your head, whatever your identity is, your politics, your personal beliefs, all that comes out as art. Just like traditional, just like fine art. I wanna give you guys a, a couple of uh, examples from this. So these are two uh, Portland-centric uh, artists. So this is Libby, Libby White, and this is one thing she did. I don't know which of these parameters are controlling what, like whether they're looking at each other, how wide they are, how tall they are, but something in that math, or something in the, that, those parameters moving around is creating this. And this is Lucas's. Can I get some sounds? Oh, there we go. Whoa, what's happening here? There's a lot of sine and cosine here happening, I bet. Web audio API, all, all JavaScript. Can you guys see this? There, so. so these are two people with entirely different backgrounds, entirely different personalities that are creating art with the same code, or the same like underlying heartbeat. So that's option number one. Go to Uncontext, make something. Option number two is CodePen. CodePen, who here knows CodePen? Yes, there's a woo over there. It's great. CodePen is rad. We talked about sketchbooks earlier and how artists have sketchbooks. CodePen is basically a global, digital, open collection of sketchbooks. And that's great. You can go in and you can look and see what people are doing, how they're getting things to look and move a certain way. And if you go to the homepage of CodePen, if you don't know, they elevate all kinds of rad projects. Some are functional, like button rollovers, but some are really weird, JavaScript or CSS experimentations. You can go in there and learn the math and see how they're sort of twisting the things that you normally think of in one way and making them into something completely different. Go to CodePen, fork something, play with it. Find something that is visually interesting and, and play with it. That's option two. Option number three is find a code group. They're everywhere, mostly, except for a lot of Asia and all of Africa and most of South America. Okay, <laughs> bad example. Uh, but anyway, they're everywhere. And you guys are all from all over the United States and all over the world. Go and find a creative code group, preferably a language agnostic one, because it would be great if you can get in a room and talk to people that do Cinder and open frameworks and open CV and all kinds of cool things sort of cross-pollinate ideas. And not just developers, but also artists. And go to your local JavaScript meetups and just start talking about art. I guarantee you from personal experience, if you just go to a, a local JavaScript meetup and you start talking about art, people are gonna wanna talk to you and they're gonna wanna make art with you. And that's how I've made some of my favorite people that I know, no, that's how I've made friends with some of my favorite people in Portland. And if you can't find one, start one. 
It's really easy. Meetup.com is free. You need you and just you, and you go find a place, and you just start making art. Tell people about it, and they'll come. Probably. Again, no guarantees. <laughs> um, oh, that's backwards. Hold on. That's it. How much time do I have? We'll just assume this is it. Five minutes? I don't have any more. I don't have any more wisdom to share. I'm just going to wrap this up. So uh, thank you, guys. Uh, this is me. I'm John Brown. And I'm making art here and here and here. I have an SEO problem. John Brown is rough. Uh, there's a lot of us. Did you guys know Inspector Gadget's real name is John Brown? <laughs> it's a fun fact. Um, so I'm making art here uh, all the time. And we just saw JavaScript, uh, CSS in JavaScript. And I just want to do, do a terrible plug for myself. But I'm actually working on this 100-day project right now where I'm exploring CSS and just raw divs, no nesting, no associated styling, no IDs or anything, and just seeing what I can do with those over 100 days. And I've done some really cool stuff. Uh, I'm doing one a day. Some are great, some are terrible, but you should check it out. And they're all posted all along here. Uh, hashtag make art every day. And that's all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.